So welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jamie Chapelsky, and I'm with the communications team at the Edmonton Arts Council. In conjunction with our colleagues uh, from the Edmonton Heritage Council, as part of the Edmonton and District Historical Society's Historic Week, I'm pleased to present Marlena Wyman and Adriana Davies, the former artists in residence at the City of Edmonton's Historic Yorra House. The Edmonton Arts Council acknowledges the traditional land on which Edmonton, a Miskachee Waskahegan sits, the territory of Treaty Six First Nations and the homelands of the Métis people. We would like to recognize and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Nehewa Cree, Dene Suline, Nakota Sioux, Soto, Blackfoot, as well as the Métis and Inuit peoples. It is a welcoming place for all people who come from around the world to share Edmonton as a home. Together, we call upon all of our collective honored traditions and spirits to work in building a great city for today and future generations. In early 2022, Adriana and Marlena were the city of Edmonton's Yorath House Artists in Residence, employing historically inspired drawings, paintings, prose, and poetry. In this talk, they discussed the history of Yorath House in the area, all of which played important roles in Edmonton's rich history from Indigenous times to present day. Adriana Davies is an established performance poet, author, curator, and historian, and was the Edmonton Heritage Council's inaugurate Heritage Writers Reserve Award recipient. Past experience includes work with the Canadian Encyclopedia and the Alberta Online Encyclopedia, as well as her collection, Changing My Skin, Dark Elegies and Other Poems. Marlena Wyman is an established visual artist and curator who has worked as an audio visual archivist at the Provincial Archives of Alberta. She is the co-founder of Urban Sketchers Edmonton and was Edmonton's Historian Laureate for two years and interpreted the position through her art practice. Following their presentations, Adriana and Marlena will have a brief Q&A so at the end of the presentation, if you have any questions that come to mind, please pop them in the chat. Um, and just so you know, this presentation is being recorded and it will be put up on the Edmonton Arts Council's YouTube page and shared with all of you as well, um, in case you wanted to revisit the presentation or you know someone who might be interested that wasn't able to attend. Uh, so now I am going to hand it off to Adriana. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted uh, to be taking part in this session. And uh, Marlena has graciously offered uh, to, uh, to be my technical support. So Marlena, can we go to the first slide, please? Well, as you can see, the, the Yorath House and the two parks have a very personal connection with me since uh, I moved into my house in Parkview in 1981. You know, I've taken my two sons and, and my grandsons there for walks and, and you know, it, it restores and the spirit and, it, and is very healing. Um, as well as a social historian, I've been fascinated by the history of Edmonton, Alberta and Canada. And I've also written poems about Edmonton and Alberta landscapes from the late 1990s onwards. I can't help but think of the river as not only a geographic feature, but also a conduit backwards and forwards through time. The interrelationship between the flowing river and the passage of time is a universal symbol. The North Saskatchewan River has carved a deep channel from its glacial origins in the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains as it meanders through the three prairie steppes to Hudson's Bay. The historic Urath House is an entry point into that journey in geological and human time. 
Yorath House and the North Saskatchewan River lots on which um, it is located are found on Treaty 6 lands. The people of the region that became Edmonton used the river's resources for nourishment. The arts residency at Yorath House in January and February of this year, which I shared with visual artist and, and archivist Marlena Wyman, allowed me to reflect on the rich history of the site. Um, and I'm just overjoyed to be able to acknowledge the support of the Edmonton Arts Council and City of Edmonton for the residency. I'll begin by reading a poem, Origin of Rivers. Great rivers begin as trickles as the ice pack melts over time. In the Rocky Mountains, Crowfoot Glacier, after the passage of a hundred years, becomes unrecognizable. Only a couple of stumps. The water roars down sluices and tunnels, going underground and pooling in expanses of milky aquamarine lakes, teeth chatteringly cold. From north to south, the rivers are named Peace and Athabasca, North and South Saskatchewan, Bow, Elbow and Milk. They have carved deep channels in the glacial sediment and given the land its final shape. With exploration and settlement, we named things, but they already had age old names, some of which remain in words exotic and sibilant, like Saskatchewan, Sipiwinawak, and Amiskwichi. But this other land where great herds of buffalo roamed and indigenous people had dominion is gone, remembered only through historic markers, such as a tail creek commemorating the last buffalo kill, ending the nomadic life of indigenous people and Métis hunters. They rode across the Great Plains unrestricted by provincial and state boundaries. When we think of transportation today, we think of roads, railways, and airplanes. But in the past, waterways were the major transportation routes and access to the river through riverlands was prized. That is why the French and in turn, Lower Canada, which became Quebec, espoused the river lot system. That is why St. Albert and Edmonton settlers squatted on river lots, which were ultimately legitimized through homestead filings. Connor Thompson in an article titled Edmonton's River Lots, a layer in our history writes, while a rough and unapproved survey was undertaken by government surveyor W.F. King um, in 1878, a more thorough government approved survey in 1882 formalized the division of the land in terms of a river lot pattern, which is what the predominantly Métis population in the area at the time desired. The survey created 44 large lots across the banks of the North Saskatchewan River, most of which stretched east of the Hudson's Bay Company reserve lands. In many ways, the early history of these river lots is a history of the Métis and their kinship networks. Marriage between the area's families was common, as were friendship and support systems. And of course, I, you know, the early, um, not only the fur traders, but the early homesteaders had an Indigenous wives, so that's really important. Yorath House and Buena Vista and Laurier Parks are located on Treaty 6 lands. The people of the region that became Edmonton are people of the river, the River Cree. They have lived and gathered here since time immemorial through the eras of the treaties to the present um, in Indigenous terms. Um, they speak of 11 generations, um, each generation 100 years. On December the 20th, 2020, Edmonton City Council passed a bylaw approving new ward, name bound, new ward boundaries and Indigenous ward names. And of course, um, the two parks in your house are located um, in Ward Sipiwinawak. As a historian and curator, I've been engaged in work with Indigenous communities since 1987. I've worked with Treaty 6, 7 and 8 First Nations and the Métis Nation of Alberta, advising them about museum development and later jointly creating content for the Alberta Online Encyclopedia. What I, this talk is going to do is really give you a, a timeline of happenings at that 
particular geographical spot that we're interested in. The territories that became Canada initially attracted the attention of the British and French. And I think we might as well move along the slide. Sorry, Marlena, can you, uh, Yorath House situating us in, in place, next. And of course, um, the treaty medals. Um, you know, the fur trade companies came, they prospered, and e eventually with the decline of the fur trade, from the mid 1850s onward, the government of Canada was intent on colonizing traditional indigenous lands. With the signing of Treaty Number no. 6 on August 23rd, 1876 at Fort um, Carleton and on September 9th at Fort Pitt, the federal government was ready to unite the country, you know, to use the, the um, jargon of the day from sea to shining sea through the building of a railway. And the territory in question covered most of the central portions of what became, in 1905, the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta. The signatories were representatives of the Canadian Crown and the Cree, Chippewyan and Stony Nations. Uh, the, at the Fort Carleton meeting on the, on the part of First Nations, Chief Mr. Wasses, Big Child and Chief Akta Kakoop Star Blanket represented the Carleton Cree. On the part of the Crown, principal negotiators were Alexander Morris, Lieutenant Governor of the Northwest Territories, James Mackay, a Métis fur trader and Minister of Agriculture for Manitoba, and W.J. Christie, Chief Factor of the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, basically, the surveys began in the period 1871 and 1879. Um, the most important one from our perspective is 1881, with the largest survey, which included Alberta. Um, and over 27 million quarter sections were surveyed by 1883. Maps and plans were given to the province and townships, townships were composed of 36 sections and sections comprised four quarter sections or 16 subdivisions. So we're, we're I'm setting the context now for homesteading, but really there is an interesting um, hiccup, as it were, in terms of the homesteading. Um, the 1859 uh, Palliser expedition, um, which in, involved geologists, um, discovered the presence of gold flakes at Fort Edmonton. And so basically in the, in the 1860s, we saw um, gold miners arriving, you know, some came via the California gold rush uh, BC, um, and they ended up in Edmonton. Um, and among these was James Gibbons, who panned for gold on the North Saskatchewan River and actually squatted. He built a cabin in, in what was known as um, uh, the um, uh, Miner's Flats, uh, which is the, uh, the sandy and gravel area just below um, Yorath House. Um, and I mean, in terms of then the settlement of, of the city, um, Malcolm Grote, who was an employee of the, um, of the Hudson's Bay Company, obtained a huge tract of, of land um, in 1870 after the Hudson Bay Company selected 3,000 acres um, around uh, the fort. Grote claimed 900 acres of land along the western edge of the reserve. Um, and retired there in 1878 with his wife, Marguerite, daughter of Chief Factor William Joseph Christie and their nine children. And the Old Grote Homestead stretched from today's 121st Street to 149th Street and from the River Valley to 111th Avenue. Well, you know, the 1882 map, you know, shows the snowman's land to the left. And of course, that's that. A lot of it was um, occupied by squatters, some of whom were gold seekers. And can we um, move along now, the slides? Uh, there is the Métis script. Uh, next, uh, the fur fort. Next, and there is the map. 
And so you can see that uh, the area that we're talking about is beyond the left side of the map. Um, uh, so, but so that you can see the 44 River lots and then the Hudson's Bay Reserve. Next. And there's the man, the, the individual operation. Next. And uh, an additional uh, gold panning scene. Next. And there you get the dredge. The dredge is in operation. In the 1880s, uh, dredging became common, and the 30-foot eastern dredge worked the miners' flats area, um, which later became part of Laurier Park. In the summer of 1895, it returned $9 a day for a crew of three, while nearby two men mining by hand were earning $125 a day. One of the more successful dipper dredgers was owned by the Star Mining Company, a group of Strathcona businessmen. The dredge averaged $50 a day. Well, when you tra translate that to contemporary dollars, it was a significant industry. I'll now talk about the key homesteaders in, in the area that, that we're interested in, which is the uh, uh, Laurier, what became Laurier Park and Buena Vista Road. Gilbert John Anderson filed for a homestead, um, Section 25, Township 52, Range 25, Meridian 4, which was part of the, what became the Laurier Park lands in 1885. The filing indicates that he's been a minor for 20 years and has two children and that this will be his permanent residence. Um, he mentions specifically having cattle and four horses, and that the land includes a chicken house and stable. Um, then we, in, he, another uh, uh, file at that time was that by Thomas Charles Stevenson, known as, as English Charlie, and he also filed in that area. And what's interesting is that Gil um, Anderson Stevenson and Gibbons were all friends and they all signed their, each other's homestead um, papers. And they were part of the Anglo-Irish establishment. Um, Jim Gibbons had actually squatted in the area from 1878 and was part of that initial survey that I mentioned, the King survey. But he actually filed for a homestead in 1893 and it comprised 80 acres. Um, and the value was placed at $1,000. Um, in 1873, Gibbons had married Mary Isabel Anderson, a stepdaughter of Gilbert Anderson. Um, and of course, uh, his wife uh, was Métis and as, as was her daughter. So in the period 18, 95 to 97, gold mining activity in Edmonton peaked, and it's estimated that over 300 miners arrived to work the sandbars along a 100 kilometer stretch of the river upstream. By the summer of 1898, the stampede was over, with local merchants having taken in $500,000. So, I mean, you know, it, it was booming. Um, What's interesting is that in 1903, Charles Stevenson um, sold, sold a portion of his homestead, which later uh, became part of the parklands, to realtor um, Sam Smith, who was also a city alderman. Um, and he, you know, in, in, in terms of what we know about Stevenson, it's uh, what Smith wrote, and this is in the, in the archives and that um, it, the, once um, Smith sold his land, um, he was not able to purchase a portion of it, and that's significant, which remained in the hands of, of his grandson. And we'll talk about that. But just to give you an idea of the development of Edmonton, because now we get an, a boom, a real estate boom. Between 1903 and 1914, 274 new subdivisions were created, which inflated the assessed value of city property to 191 million. Most of these existed only on paper and would never be developed. 
This rate represented an 1,800% increase in the number of subdivisions on the north side alone, compared with an 800% increase in the total population of Edmonton between 1904 to 1914. Um, the cumulative result was the creation of a blueprint for a greater Edmonton that dazzled the imagination of Edmonton boosters, most of them city councillors and professionals and, of course, uh, property developers and brokerage firms. Um, let's go to the next slide. And you see a storefront um, advertising supplies for prospectors next. And I looked for a picture of Jim Gibbons, and there he is on um, the left with A.D. Osborne and, and Donald Ross. Um, and you can see they had their fingers in, in everything. Um, he was also into cigar um, manufacturing. Um, Gibbons also was an Indian agent and responsible for um, sales of, of, of Indigenous land, including on the Enoch Reserve. And the, of course, there's been litigation to reclaim some of those lands with success. Of course, the boom accelerated when Edmonton, um, when the province was declared officially in 1905, and then Edmonton was declared the capital city. Um, now, what is intriguing is that the province, um, you know, they all had, they were dreamers and they dreamed big. And one of the things that they did is that they immediately planned the Legislative Assembly of Alberta. Um, let's move on to the next um, slides. Um, so that's the Driscoll map of 1912. So you can see all of those subdivisions, but a large number of them were undeveloped. They were just simply filed. Uh, next. Um, of course, I, you know, I had to look at tax the tax rolls and uh, various other materials. So, uh, you know, a cheer for um, archives, not only the city of Edmonton archives, but also, um, you know, the provincial archives of Alberta and uh, other archives. Next. And this is a fascinating image. You can see the view of, of Fort Edmonton, which was on the plateau um, just below the Legislative Assembly, this grand neoclassical style um, building. So at the same time as the legislature was being planned, uh, the province hired in 1906 a preeminent um, uh, a landscape architect, Frederick Todd, um, who had studied um, in the US um, under Frederick Law Olmsted, responsible for um, Central Park in New York and also Montreal's Mont Royal. Um, and he, um, uh, you know, in 1907, and you'll find this in the city archives, he proposed a, a blueprint, as it were, for the development of the city, really. And this, the, the city was a part of the Garden City movement from these early days. Um, and he recommended also that building not occur um, on uh, the vistas overlooking the River Valley and also the River Valley. If we can just quickly move through um, the, the slides now, Marlena. Uh, there you have the grand design for the legislature grounds. Next. You can see the high level bridge. Next. And there is um, Laurier Park in 1913. Uh, the city acquired the land in 1909 and in uh, 1910 uh, when uh, Laurier uh, PM visited, it was named for him. And it was manicured and groomed, and it was a popular gathering place. Next. And other developers wanted the city to give them advantages and conceptualize um, park developments. Um, this one did not go ahead in white mud. Next. And you can see boating on the river was incredibly popular. Next. And, um, you know, until 
the, the late 1940s, you had some of those um, dugouts and cabins along the river. Um, next. And uh, the, the provincial archivist, Catherine Hughes was asked to recommend names for city parks, about 20 of them. And five of the names she recommended were indigenous, you know, which is interesting. Next. And you can see here then um, Laurier Park. Next. And uh, the sedimentary banks of the river, again with the pleasure craft. Next. And uh, the uh, Yorath House. Um, Yorath House really is a signal of the ninth, the the Le, coming in of the Leduc and Redwater Fields in 1947. And um, uh, uh, Dennis Yorath, um, like his father before him, had headed up prominent oil companies and utility companies. And so he was transferred to Edmonton from Calgary and commissioned a uh, rural win and rural um, to design this home. And you can see that it's not a craftsman style house, which really was a signal of the previous boom. It's, it's a modern style house. And it was a family home um, until Bet Yorath, um, his wife died um, in the early 90s and the city acquired it. And basically it sat vacant for many, many years until it was officially designated and restored and open to the public. Um, let's just finish the, the final slides, Marlena. And as I said, it was a, a beloved family home, uh, very well taken care of. Uh, they were part, the family was part of the uh, establishment and the business elite. Next. Um, Dennis and, and his father headed Canadian Western Natural Gas Company and Northwestern Utilities. Next. And there is the cairn that the family had built to commemorate the ancestors. And of course, it's reminiscent of the stone fireplace um, in the Stevenson home. Next. Um, next some family members. Next. Next. And of course, then the rest of the developments in that area, uh, Laurier Park, the Storyland Valley Zoo, and so on. And I think we'll stop there, Marlene. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Adriana, for that great background to the area around your house. And now I'm going to speak a bit about um, my participation there. And uh, thanks also to the Edmonton and District Historical Society, the Edmonton Arts Council, and the Edmonton Heritage, Council, Heritage Council for this opportunity to uh, talk about our experience at your house as artists in residence. And, and I'm particularly grateful to the city for supporting Edmonton artists with this initiative, which has been a difficult time recently with the pandemic. And I also wanted to say that it was an excellent experience to work with writer, poet, and historian Adriana Davies as my residency partner. So every artist will interpret their residency differently. And because Adriana and I have strong connections to both history and arts communities, the history of Yorath House and the surrounding area informed our artist's residency. And we began our collaboration fairly early on. Adriana had suggested writing a post each week for the Edmonton Arts Council blog, and those posts are still available for viewing and reading. And Adriana carried out a great deal of archival research for her writing. And when she came back from the archives, we would talk about what she'd found. And that was where a lot of my inspiration came from. 
uh, with Adriana's research and writing and my artworks, we really ended up creating the basic elements of an artistically inspired illustrated history of Yoreth House and the surrounding River Valley area from Indigenous times forward. Uh, Dennis and Bet Yoreth, as Adriana mentioned, built their home in the River Valley in 1949. And the, the firm Rule, Win and Rule, who designed their home, also designed other Edmonton buildings, such as Rutherford Library, Beth Shalom Synagogue, and the original Barscona Theater. Uh, the Barskin, Barscona Theater was sadly demolished in 1987. Yorath House was built in the Laurier Heights area, which was originally subdivided down to the North Saskatchewan River. And um, it was designated, Yorath House was designated after the purchase by the city as a historic site in 2015. And in 2019, the city renovated the interior as a public space that can be rented now for weddings, meetings, and other events, as well as continuing to serve as an artist residency. This was my studio space at Yorath House. Um, the process of creating art is meditative and it's good for the soul. It takes us away from the woes of the world. When I'm drawing or painting, everything else disappears. And I think that's good for everyone to create, no matter what creative genre you may be interested in or whether we're beginners or professionals or anywhere in between. An artist residency in my own city is a new experience for me. Uh, Yarath House is a studio residency only. Other residencies also include live-in spaces, and I've been an artist in residence in other parts of Canada, including Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, which have included both living and studio space. Uh, what's interesting about a lot of um, artist residencies is, is they often are in heritage buildings, and heritage is a good complement for creative inspiration. This is um, Adriana's area, uh, studio space, um, which was in the same room as my studio at Yorath House. I think I might have missed this. No, I got it. Okay. <laughs> so undisturbed time alone and away from home is inspirational and productive. Poet Mary Oliver said, creative work needs solitude. She explains this by saying, I am at my desk, then the phone rings or someone raps at the door. I'm deep in the machinery of my wits. Reluctantly, I rise, I answer the phone, or I open the door, and the thought which I had in hand, or almost in hand, is gone. Creative work needs solitude. It needs concentration without interruption. A place apart to pace, to chew pencils, to scribble and erase, and scribble again. But just as often, it, or if not more often, the interruption comes not from another, but from the self. And what does it have to say? that you must phone the dentist, that you are out of mustard, that your Uncle Stanley's birthday is two weeks hence. You react, of course, then you return to your work only to find that the imps of ideas have fled back into the mist. <clears throat> so one of my residencies, um, artist residencies was in author Wallace Stegner's childhood home in East End, Saskatchewan, built in 1917, and that's the house on the left. And my accommodation and studio were both in the house. Another artist residency was in Newfoundland um, on the right. I stayed in a cabin, not, not this building. I stayed in a cabin that also served as my studio near the outport of Brigus. And a collaborative exhibit with works by me and by other artists who were in nearby residencies was held at St. George's Heritage Church and Cultural Center in Brigus, which is the, the building pictured here. It was originally built in 1876 as an Anglican church. The concepts of artist and residence collaborations and solo work each have unique qualities. Collaboration can spark ideas that solitary residencies would not, but solitude, as I mentioned, is essential to much of creative work. So the seven day per week flexibility that Yorath House offered allowed Adriana and I to find a balance between time together and collaboration and solitary time alone. And we worked out a schedule to allow for that. This is my sketch of the stately front door at Yarath House. Now, our first couple of weeks at the residency, because we were there in January and February, were, were during January's deep freeze that you might recall. So we stayed indoors and began our work with the inspiration that the house itself provided. With my heritage background and Adriana's as well, 
we were both drawn to document original interior features that were preserved after renovations. This is my drawing of the original freezer doors that have been preserved in your house after the, after the renovation. They look like ice boxes, um, but had been powered by electricity. They were originally adjacent to the kitchen where the family, when the family had lived there. Adriana was able to locate some of the family members who we then interviewed. And um, we, our thanks go to Jillian, Elizabeth and Rick, those family members. Uh, Adriana also interviewed Ilsa Hannibal Mesmer, the Yorath's maid who worked and lived there in 1953. All of them provided us with wonderful detailed memories and photographs that also helped us to visualize what the house looked like when the family was living there. The original fieldstone fireplace, it still exists and it divided the living and dining room areas and it extends to an outdoor cooking area and patio. And the Yorath family told us that here is where Dennis and Matt would entertain almost every weekend both with indoor cocktail parties and outdoor garden parties, including a party that they had hosted for Prince Philip when he visited in 1978 for the Commonwealth Games. This is my drawing of the main staircase, which is a stunning custom timber staircase with a woven wood balustrade. Now throughout the house, more durable laminate flooring covers the house's, house's original carpets and hardwood floors, but these wood um, some of these wooden features are original, and the original hardwood flooring can be seen on the staircase landing on, um, going up toward the second floor. This is on the second floor. There is a brick fireplace in what had been the primary bedroom suite. And this drawing that I did, actually, I included that green chair is mine. I brought it in from home while I was at the residency because I just thought it fit that the modern style of the house so well. It's a mid-century modern chair. And um, so I positioned it in there and it was my little bit of home and comfort while I was at the, the house as well. So this is actually the first sketch that I did. It is of the brick chimney in our studio space on the second floor. Now the, the room where we have, where the artist's studio is, was originally the family's, uh, Yarath family's entertainment and TV room. And after Dennis Yarath died, that was living alone in that large house. So part of the house, including this room, was renova renovated into a rental apartment. And those renovations were done by architect Rick Wilkin, who is Beth's nephew. With these um, sketches or drawings that you had seen before, I wanted to be true to the details of the house. So those were fairly exacting. However, after I've been drawing like that for a while, I always feel the need to loosen up. So a drawing method called continuous line drawing helps me to do that. And it is what it sounds like. You put your pen down on the page and keep drawing without lifting your pen. And this drawing is an example of that. And it shows the side of the house where the city constructed an addition to add an elevator and public washrooms. And that addition is well integrated into the architecture of the house on the exterior. As the weather improved, I began to go for walks along the many beautiful paths surrounding the house and along the river in Buena Vista Park and Laurier Park. So I began to gather inspiration from the natural history of the area as well as the built heritage. There are a lot of people walking their dogs around Yarath House, and there are a lot of dogs. We were quite surprised to see how many there were. I think that that idea of getting dogs and pets during um, COVID actually was true. And so there were so many that I actually avoided walking the paths on weekends because they were so crowded. But this is a non-crowded weekday sketch that um, looking up from the river toward Yarath House, and this is the area where originally the family's lawn and flower and vegetable gardens were located. Yorath House was built in what is now Buena Vista Park and the land on the Yorath side of the river forms a gentle slope down to the water or for us down to the ice and snow on the river. So the, the side that Yorath House is on is not the typical steep banks. And I'm sure that's probably partly why Yoreths had decided to build there. So there was a gentle slope down to, to the river directly behind their house. 
And this sketch is from the location of the boat launch, uh, it, which is the area that the Edmonton Rowing Club uses. And Yorath House sits between the Rowing Club and the Edmonton Valley Zoo. So this, this is looking down or up the river. <laughs> I can't remember whether it was down or up the river, but it's, it's a river view with snow on the river. Now to also um, put the placement of Yorath House in mind, this uh, Yorath House is directly across the river from Pewter Point, which is also known as the end of the world. And the cement pillars are what is left of the retaining wall of the old Keeler Road after a uh, landslide took out the road in 2002. And the city um, built a viewing point on top of those pillars. And this, I went over to that side of the river, and this is a sketch that I did from Keeler Point looking across the river. And Yarath House would be off the sketch to the right. So the steep river banks that typify most of the North Saskatchewan River as it runs through Edmonton is what has kept development away from the riverbanks for the most part. In fact, a few houses have suffered the same fate as Keeler Road when they were built too close to the edge. Uh, the city has maintained a strip of parkland along much of the river in the general area of Yorath House. And this sketch is along Valley View Drive, looking toward and across the river. So that um, there is park space, there is, there is housing that can overlook the river, but there's park space between the houses and the river, which is wonderful that the city has, has been able to maintain that. Now, inspiration can come from many sources. The walls of Yorath House are graced with inspiring artworks by major Alberta artists that are on loan from the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. And these works were carefully curated by the AFA's art collections consultant, Gail Lint, to complement the early modern style and era of the house. And these, um, these artworks have been in place since the opening of the house to the public. So I was especially pleased to see four artworks in the house by Marion McKay Nichol two of which are titled January and February, which were the months of our residency. So her print is on the left side of this photograph here. It's titled January. And it, it's situated at the top of the stairs and leading into what had been the primary bedroom suite, which is where these other artworks are. And off to the right here, um, above, that, above the staircase on the second floor, is Nichols' print titled February and it's situated across from her January print. Now, Marion Nichol was on the cutting edge of Alberta's early abstract art movement, and her work paved the way for the acceptance of female artists in a male-dominated art scene of the mid-century. And Nichol provided her muse to me, and her artworks were a beginning point in my walks through the winter trees near Yorath House. I became aware of forms that echoed those in Nichols January print. So this is her January print to the left and to the right as I walked through the pathways and I saw the moon in, in, the, in the daylight sky and I saw the path through the trees. It made me think of Marion Nichols January and I went back to the studio and made this drawing. I did the same thing with her February print <clears throat> and that same inspiration happened when I was looking up at the house from the river. And that's also the view that I saw of the dog walker. And one of the thin central lines, lines in Nichols February is a red brown, which I interpreted as the wooden exterior of Yorath House in the center of my painting. When looking at the house from the riverside, there is this large expanse of open mm -hmm. land leading up to the house and trees that surround it on all sides. Uh, this print on the left of Mary Nichols is, is not in Yorath House, but again, when I was doing some research about her, it was another um, of her winter paintings that is more connected to the setting up Yorath House than might be initially thought. It's, it's called Prairie Farm. And as Adriana mentioned, there were farms in the River Valley where Yorath House is now situated and in what is now parkland. It had been the site of chicken, turkey, and mink farms, along with agricultural, other agricultural activities. And on the right, this is my abstracted view 
that includes the, the side of the house and looking across toward the river. So the freedom of time and space in artist residencies also encourages experimentation in new techniques and materials. And I started to use a new technique with uh, a water soluble wax crayon on paper and on mylar, which creates a delicate airy appearance. And this painting shows Yarath House in the center front and the Laurier Heights neighborhood. And again, this was from a viewpoint, a cuter point across the river. And this is the same technique and, and the same water soluble wax crayon on mylar. And I, I did this painting uh, from a photograph that the Yorath family had shown us of the family's garden from the 1980s. And the Yorath daughters told us that their, their mother Bet was a keen gardener and Dennis pitched in with some of the vegetable gardening. There were massive flower beds and vegetable gardens to the back and side of the house, and there also had been a greenhouse that was attached to the garage. The Yoras had also signed on to sponsor displaced persons. Um, the Government of Canada was advertising for host families, and this was in the, the, the um, late 40s, when the Yoras lived in Calgary. Sorry, it would be mid-40s when the Yoras lived in Calgary. And they arranged for Ayn and Kranz from Riga, Latvia to come to Canada. And Dennis located her fiance, Henry, in a European internment camp and arranged for their wedding when they arrived. The Yoras had a huge garden in Calgary as well before they moved to Edmonton and they had hired the Kranzes to help them to care for the gardens. Adriana's research also brought to light photographs from various archives and from the as well as from the Yorath's own family collection. So I based this painting on a City of Edmonton archival photograph of women on an outing in Laurier Park in 1913. For this and the following paintings, the technique I used is image transfer and pigmented oil sticks on my mind. I'm always inspired by archival photographs. And when the Yorath family shared photographs with us from their personal family archives and incorporated images of some of them into, into my paintings. Um, this is my painting of Dennis Yorath. And besides his work as president of Northwestern Utilities and in other businesses, and his many aspects of community and philanthropic work, the Yorath daughters told us that he was an excellent horseman from an early age and played polo, including with Prince Edward on his visits to Calgary. They told us that their father was also a skilled aviator who learned to fly in his early 20s. He flew a Tiger Moth airplane and was a friend of First World War flying ace Wilfred Wap May. Dennis lived in Lethbridge from 1939 to 1945 as head of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. His daughters told us that he was very concerned about the air crews that he helped train and he grieved at the loss of lives. I, I usually begin my archive begin with archival research for my paintings, but because Adriana had undertaken such exacting research for her writing, I was able to use her research as inspiration for my work. And this is my painting of Bette Yorath, who was an accomplished horsewoman. She brought her horse, Lady Patricia, to Edmonton when they moved here. The current Yorath House parking lot was the pasture, and some horses belonging to neighbors grazed there too. When they lived in Calgary, Bet had a garden bed devoted to peonies, which she bred, entered in competitions, and won prizes for. She transplanted some of the peonies from, garden, from the Calgary garden into her Yorath house flower beds after they moved here. Now this painting is based on image transfers of family photos again. The photo on the right is of young cousins, Rick Wilkin, Jillian Yorath and Jocelyn Yorath at the family's cottage at Capasuan Beach on Lake Wabaman. Jillian and Jocelyn were sisters and Rick was cousin. The story of Jocelyn touched me in particular when I heard that she had died tragically of leukemia at the age of 12 in 1950. And I find that when I'm creating an artwork based on archival documents, a haunting photograph or a handwritten passage in a diary or a letter of a long dead stranger can create a profound personal collect connection for me. And some of some viewers of my artworks have shared that they feel this as well. 
The photographs on the left in this painting are of some of the Yorath women with the kitchen in the background. <clears throat> the family's social get togethers included kitchen parties too. And now this style is a bit different than my usual. And I, although it was not intentional at the time that I painted it, after one of my walks through the house, I realized that the prints by Michael Snow that hang in the house must have had a subconscious influence on me. And here are some of his prints. Now I went back to Yoreth House recently and painted a summer scene. It is a beautiful house and a beautiful year round setting. And no doubt it has provided inspiration of the varying seasons to all of the artists in residence who have worked there. So thank you for your attention. And, and now if there are any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, before people rush in to, with questions, um, I'm going to fill in the gap. Um, you know, this, the city of Edmonton had, um, you know, a, a parks department, um, you know, in the 1912 period, and there's massive correspondence, and they were dealing with landscape architects uh, throughout Canada and the US and even the UK. So I mean, so they were very, very forward thinking. And of course, I mean, in terms of that, the that early stage of massive development and urbanization, it ended in mid 1913, you know, with the worldwide recession. And of course, I mean, it didn't return until after the oil boom beginning in 1947. So it's interesting to have that as a context. Uh, 1912, um, the, the, a Buena Vista subdivision was planned in that area of a Buena Vista Laurier um, parks. Um, uh, although there was that L-shaped plot for that was acquired for um, Laurier. But the developers, uh, of course, couldn't develop the Buena Vista subdivision. Um, some houses were built. And also, you know, th there was the farmland, the pink farm, I mean, all of those things that Marlena alluded to. But then by 1951, the city had decided that they did not want residential areas in the parkland. And so basically, it, it wasn't an expropriation that happened immediately. They basically said to the owners that they could live there until they chose to sell. And then they had to sell to the city. And so that's then how the land for Buena Vista Park was um, acquired and it was named for that original subdivision, Buena Vista, which means beautiful views and which harkens to um, Todd's um, garden city vision of, of, uh, of these uh, beautiful uh, vistas, right? Yeah, thanks for adding that in there, Adriana. And also something um, that I think is important to say is that early on, there was a vision of, of River Valley Green to be preserved. Uh, but through the years, there are there have been times when the city has gone back on that. And there has been development in the River Valley, which citizens have often come forward to help help to stop. And that is something we have to remain constantly vigilant about because really one of the amazing things about Edmonton is its river valley and the, um, the continuous uh, expanse of green through the city, which is either the largest or, or almost the largest in North America. And that is something that, that Edmont makes Edmonton really the special city that it is. And that area around Yorath House, if you've not explored it, is well worth taking a look. There's also a um, bridge that goes now, a pedestrian bridge, pedestrian bridge that goes from Buena Vista Park over to Horlack Park. So that you, and I, I did that walk in the winter, <laughs> which I'm very proud of <laughs> because it's about an hour return. 
but it's it's a beautiful walk along the rivers through there. And I guess that, you know, the, the continuing chapter in terms of, because we need to acknowledge that although the city has done some wonderful things, um, you know, the boom in the building of, 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 of um, major arterial roads leading into the city centre, you know, put Mackenzie and McKinnon ravines at risk. And so it took some courage on the part of local, the local community and, and some political leadership um, um, to stop that. And there is an NFB short film that, that, that was filmed in Edmonton and that looked at the threat of, uh, of roadways um, in terms of these beautiful green spaces within cities. And that, you know, this is, this was done in Edmonton prior to Jane Jacobs in, 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 uh, in Toronto, you know, I mean, so that uh, I would recommend watching that film. I mean, they don't name anyone. They, you know, they use a generic city planner or mayor or aldermanic candidate, but you know, you can recognize everyone. And, and that of course, today with the federal initiative, around national urban parks, we have an opportunity to revisit these spaces and, and to address some of the um, indigenous concerns, because as we know, these were um, indigenous lands. And so I thought it was important to begin with that period of treaty, fur trade treaties settlement. Yeah, and I see we have a question from Thea Bowring, who is actually one of the artists in residence right now at Yorath House. So Thea. There we go, I'm unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I arrived a bit late. So if, I, if I'm asking a question that, that you've already discussed, I'm sorry, but um, I'm so grateful for the work you guys have done. Um, Jody and I have both sort of delved into it at great length. And of course it raises so many more questions, and um, and of course, working every day or most days at Yorath, it's um, you really uh, you you start getting sort of you know you hunger into the house and into the landscape, and some of the questions that keep coming up for us are really about um, have to do with sort of parameters, circumference, and and the placement of the footprint of things that are like no longer there, and uh, you know trying to figure out. The 12 acres that were once you know belonged to Europe we were sort of trying to figure that out in terms of the modern um or, you know today's street system like if you guys can give us an idea of like um sort of where how far into the park um you know the oral history and stories that we hear don't quite give us the full picture and I was really sort of wanting to know that um and also um you know we were kind of stuck on Charlie's chimney wondering you know where the exact placement of that was. We were having trouble sort of, we know it was on the URF um, land because um, it was, you know, there was- You know, I'll take a stab of that. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Um, I think, uh, and there is a photograph of it in, in uh, the yeah. city archives, uh, the, re the chimney, you know, the so, remnants yeah, of this great. chimney and which Dennis offered to the city but of course it, it was beyond you know re-erection yeah. um, and I think that it was probably the I think the cabin was located in that meadow area okay. you know that and that uh, the land was acquired from uh, you know the Stevenson family by um, uh, by the Wilkins um, uh, the grandparents, and uh, they had uh, double wide lots. I've looked at the, the 1950-51 records. I think they acquired it at the end of the Second World War. And that um, uh, the, Rick Wilkins' father and, and mother were supposed to build in the adjacent lot. But of course, with the city change, the new bylaw, et cetera, they were not able to uh, to build there. So the, the the land on which the rowing club is located um, is probably part of that Wilkin um, 
property. Okay. And Melton also acquired a lot of land just uh, north, uh, above the Laurier Park, and that that then became part of the uh, the the whole Laurier subdivision, and which is interesting that um, in 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 that there wasn't a caveat as there was with respect to old Glenora as to the value of houses to be built there, but this was implied that they were supposed to be really upwardly mobile, upper middle class families with a certain income, and so you see, you know, the Laurier School, the Laurier. Um, uh, community league, all of all of those things that um, so that the West End continued, you know, the Valley View development, um, so that wealth and views. Um, shanty towns tend to be, you know, in in and in, in flatlands at the bottom of hills, and, and wealthy subdivisions are on on the top with views. Yeah, and do we know sort of how far that like the parameters the twelve acres would have gone? Um, on either side um, of I haven't. The, the 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 titles office has a huge backlog, oh, yeah. and I spoke to them um, to actually do a title search because the city doesn't have that, yeah. um, and it's historic. A, a person actually has to do uh, the historic research, and you saw some of the books that are the, the records. I mean, yeah. it, it was beyond my capacity at at, <laughs> at the time. Well, I appreciate how much you did, and it's certainly beyond my capacity, <laughs> but I, um, I, I really appreciate how much you've, you guys have given us, and I hope, yeah, I do hope that, that the house will eventually have, like, a hard copy that people, that, you know, subsequent um, um, residents and also probably other people who are renting the space can, can look at it, because it's so rich and, and interesting. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thea, and I think we'll, we'll just take one more question, which is actually a double question from Marianne Fedori. One is, will any of your work be placed in your house, asking me? And um, what we're hoping is that all of the artists and residents can maybe get together and have an exhibit at the end of all of our residencies for the year, both exhibit and performance, because as with Thea and Jody, um, there is music and, and um, writing and, and performance that could be done. So we are, um, Jamie, there's another bug in your ear. <laughs> it would be uh, it would be nice if we could have um, some sort of an exhibit and performance at the end. And then another question from uh, Marianne was for Adriana, what was your favorite family story? And I think after that, we'll, we'll have to end. Well, I think that, um, you know, it was a joy to, to speak to the family and I had a connection because I was commissioned by the Dictionary of Canadian Biography to do um, uh, the biography of, of, uh, uh, of Dennis's father, um, who was uh, in 1921, I believe he was hired by the city of Edmonton as the city manager and that he was an exponent of the Garden City movement. So that there were these different elements and that I actually interviewed a number of family members um, for, for that. Uh, but I think that like Marlena, it was um, Jillian's story of her sister um, Jocelyn's tragic death. I mean, they were spending, uh, Dennis and, and Bette were, um, away and they were staying with their grandparents and um, uh, Jillian was awoken by Jocelyn and when she turned on the light the bed was covered in blood she had had um, you know and and so when you read that and then Ilsa's recounting of her five or six months in the family home as an au pair and how Bet coached her you know after she served um, a, one of their fancy receptions, 70 or 80 people. And she kindly said that, you know, gave her some deodorant and suggested that she could pick this up at any, um, you know, drugstore. So there is this young woman who's, who had lived on a farm um, near Dresden and the family had witnessed the bombings. Her brother had been a soldier in the German army and, and who, when, of course, the Soviet occupation, you get all of this first 
hand account. I mean, she actually wrote a memoir. She attended the uh, writing courses at the Lions Seniors Club so that she, uh, you know, the 50s um, upper class life is encapsulated in this chapter in Ilsa's biography, which is again, amazing. And I could only include a little bit of that in, in, in the blog post. Right, thanks. So I don't know, Jamie, do you need to do an official ending? <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, so on behalf of the Edmonton Arts Council and the Edmonton Heritage Council, I would really love to thank Marlena and Adriana for this really fantastic presentation. And I would like to thank everyone who attended here today. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, just as a reminder, the session has been recorded, uh, so I will be sending out the recording to anyone who registered for the talk, um, and it will also be posted on the Edmonton Arts Council's YouTube page, so feel free to share as soon as that's available. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you.